Well, good day, guys, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Mitch Docker, your host. This is Life in the Peloton, of course, presented to you by MAP, our major partner. And look, you may remember back in March, I embarked on the Equinox, a brief moment of balance where we all experienced 12 hours of light and darkness in both hemispheres. And as daylight extends for some and less for others, with MAP, we embrace this global connection. And what you can do is you can roll with us for 12 hours from daybreak to sundown over a week long of series of rides coming up this equinox. It's happening again this September. Yep. Keep your eyes peeled for more information. It's coming up. It's a lot of fun. Look, it is a real challenge riding for 12 hours over that sunlight. But at the end of the day, it was a really cool experience. Well, guys, I've got a bit of different direction for you this week. Josh Portner. Now, some of you out there would know this name because he is an absolute legend when it comes to the technical industry. He's 24 years in the industry. He was working for 15 years over at Zip as a technical director, and he did a whole bunch of things there. At this time, though, he is the CEO of Silka. We're going to get into that story more in the podcast. But he is also the marginal gains guy. He's got his own podcast about it. That is what he is. He is the go-to for professional teams and individuals who want to know what is the best out there when it comes to the bike technology and in terms of aerodynamics, speed, and optimal performance. He was a guy working back at CSC in the day when Fabian Cancellar won Paris-Roubaix. He waxed his chain when it came to him winning the Olympic time trial right through to setting up Alex Dowsett to attempting the hour record, and so much more. I've only tapped on a few things that I know off the top of my head. He is involved in everything. And he was working with EF Education First when I was riding there, and I met him back in 2019 when he was asked to come on board to help develop the tubeless tyre revolution into the road racing scene. Yet, Andreas Clear brought him across at Paru Bay to get on the front of it. We were one of the first teams to use tubeless tyres in Paris Bay and in the rest of road racing. Look, it's something that we now expect as the norm. He's a really, really cool guy. It's a bit of a different direction, like I said, in Life in the Pels, and it's a bit of a technical episode, but Josh is such an awesome guy. If you've heard his podcast, he's so easy to listen to. He breaks it down so we can understand. There's so much to unpack in this, and I guarantee everyone is going to take something away from this podcast. Look, just before we get there, It is gravel season starting up over here in Australia and also in the Northern Hemisphere as well. It's changing. The seasons are changing. We're coming out of winter. We're coming into autumn over there as well. And gravel is kicking off. But of course, over here in Lansfield, we have got the specialized Dirty Docker is upon us. The 12th, 13th of October. And it's going to be such a fun thing. This is it. This has been a big project for me over the last couple of years. Something I've wanted to do, put in my hometown, get into the gravel scene, and I've created the Specialized Dirty Docker. Saturday is all about getting out there. It's a cross cyclocross event called Cross Vegas, plus a cross country runny event called the Lanny Cross Country Run. So there's a bit of everything, but Sunday is a premier event. The co borsum gravel event. There's distances for everyone. If this is the first time you're hearing about it, make sure you get your entries in and make sure you stay over on Saturday night because that's what it's all about. It's a festival. We're going to be camping. There's live music, fire pits. We're even going to be rolling in outdoor saunas. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're going to have to come and check that out. That's going to be all held in, of course, Land Vegas, the infamous Lansfield. Well, guys, sit back and enjoy this one. This is a fantastic episode. I bring you Josh Portner. Well, Josh, Josh Fortner, mate. Well, welcome to the podcast. This is um, this is a bit of a different spin for life in the Peloton. Well, it's not saying that we haven't done a technical one over the years, but it's been a little while and we've never had someone of your expertise on the podcast. It's a very special welcome to Josh. How are you, mate? Oh, I'm good, man. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, look, you're you're very accustomed to a podcast. You've got your own podcast, Marginal Gains, but YouTube channel, but also you you featured on a lot of podcasts because you're you're such an interesting guy. You've been in the industry for over twenty years. I want to just we're going to focus on 
a lot of things in this podcast, what you're doing right now, your experience in teams, but I want to rewind back to a period that really does interest me, and it's got to do with Zip. You were over at Zip Wheels for 15 years as a bit of a technical director over there, um, but the thing that interests me the most, and I'm always going to bring it back to this, is Paris Roubaix. Uh, look, I love this. If I can weave Roubaix into every podcast, I try and do it. And for you, you revolutionised what happened at Roubaix. And I always remember back, you know, I didn't exactly know when it was, but these wheels started to appear. And it, it was around sort of, I guess, 2003 through to 2006. This, this revolutionised sort of where we saw carbon wheels starting to come onto the cobblestones. Um, you were the man behind this. Can you just run me through? It's a bit of an open question, but I know we've spoken about this before. Um, tell me a little bit about this time back at, back in Zip and this sort of this period where we started to see you know Roubaix getting faster. Oh man, yeah. I mean that you know I was obsessed with Roubaix for God so many years, and still in some ways am. Right, <laughs> right. It's one of those like no matter how many times you've been, you've seen it. Um, no matter what you know about it, you, you always just come back for more, right? Mm. Um, but yeah, you know, we I got to Zip 99 and it had just been bought by a guy named Andy Ording. And it was really a triathlon brand. And, you know, I had raced road, raced in Europe for a couple seasons and went to engineering school and, and really thought I was done with bikes. I ended up here in Indianapolis uh, with race cars and then met Andy right after he bought the Zip brand and was like, oh. This is cool. Like this guy's mm. doing some, he, he's just an amazing, he's, he's actually my business partner at Silica today. So we, we've worked together now for 25 years, um, but started with, with the company and with this idea of like, okay, we need to take this tech to road because nobody was riding carbon wheels in road, you know, really at all. And, um, you know, you'd get to that point. Zip was Zip was mainly in triathlon, wasn't it? Yeah. It was pretty much a triathlon brand. You know, we, mm. we, I mean, you know, we had the odd like Jackie Duran, like, you know, he would nick the TT wheels off the bus at Lotto and like, you know, like cobble together. Like he he literally had a, a front 404 in like 99 that he had cut out and relaced onto a 36 hole uh, Dura-Ace hub like every other hole so he could ride it as a rear. And all of a sudden, you know, he's he, like they were time trialing on the wheels, but they weren't road racing on them. And all of a sudden we're like. Jackie's in another like suicide breakaway on a 404. Like wh what's happening? Um, <laughs> but there were very, few, you know, you'd have, you know, if you remember like, you know, Jan Ulrich, like, you know, riding lightweights up the mountain, but not down. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, there, there just weren't a lot of carbon wheels. And my, my dream was like it, carbon wheels, every rider, every day would just change the sport um, because of the advantage. Just just there, why why was that? Why were guys so scared? And we'll get to Roubaix. Why were so scared to do those things, to go downhill? Was this idea that carbon wasn't as strong, that it was just going to fall apart? Why why weren't we road racing it? Why weren't we going downhills? Why weren't we using it all the time? Because clearly these guys, these top-level guys, understood that there was a gain there. Well, I think they didn't. Um, I think ah. that, that was a huge – like the, the gain from every athlete you spoke to of that era, the only gain was weight. Um, yeah, right. And then the negatives were, you know, breaking with carbon rims. They, uh, you know, they they were so light that sometimes the imbalance of the wheel, you know, this is one of the lightweight problems and what really freaked Ulrich out. The um, the valve stems were still brass, right? And the valve extenders were still brass. And so you get like 12, 15 grams of imbalance on a ultra lightweight wheel, like a lightweight. And all of a sudden mm. at 60 miles an hour, it feels like a speed wobble. It's not, but it, <laughs> it feels like it. Right. And so, um, ah. so the riders were thinking, well, it only helps with weight and nothing else. So why are we going to ride them? And nobody believed arrow. Um, you know, I, uh, God, I think I spent 2000 through 2003 meeting with team managers, you know, DS is really trying to drive this home and, and got nowhere. And then the, the gift to us really was the SRM, um, the, the adoption mm. of the SRM. And all of a sudden we, you know, we had this sort of the lingua franca, right. Of, of uh, the watt, right. All mm. of a sudden you, everybody knew what a watt was and, you know, that just hadn't been true three, four, five years earlier. And so, yeah, it was Oh three. We, we took some wheels to uh, Luca, Italy, where Bjarne Reese had a uh, like a compound, and they would do a training camp there for CSC. And 
we put the riders on the w- different wheels and we had them do little like loops. Um, and you could just see it in the data. It was clear as day. And, and you know, I think Bjarne was the kind of team manager who could tell the riders, no, you're going to ride the wheel and they would do it. Um and and that was it. And so, you know, 2004, we get CSC on the wheels. And all of a sudden, within a couple of years, like all the teams have carbon wheels except at Roubaix. And so for yeah. me, it was this thing of like, okay, we're we're pretty largely responsible for this carbon wheel thing generally. But man, the first company that can win Roubaix, like that's that's huge. And so I just I spent year and and failed. I mean, failed miserably for years. I mean, I would go <laughs> we, we had we had a couple of tests where we had planned to be like in the Arnberg forest for, you know, two, three days. And literally we'd, we'd take like 30 wheels over and break all of them in like two hours. And then you're just kind of standing there by the van, like Ooh, uh, lunch, any, you know, dinner? <laughs> <laughs> what next? And, and so we, we weren't helping ourselves because the riders, it just kept reinforcing for the riders. Like it won't work. It won't work. Um, and then we finally really hit on this kind of combination of things. You know, we developed this, really wide rim, which is a thing now, but wasn't a thing then. Um, we really put the time and the energy into proving that the wider tires weren't slower, which everybody thought, mm. you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I think my, the lowest period there was, I think, I think it was 07 or 08 Magnus Backstedt. We'd, we'd done a ton of work with him, um, you know, cause he had won it previously and then he was at slipstream and we were at mm-hmm. slipstream and so like oh magnus you know if you can like these wheels with the 27 will survive the arnberg and we went we tested it worked and then this combination of you know he shows up that year and he's can't remember i think at the time he told me he was one stone overweight you know me like the engineer i'm like what the hell is a stone you know thank god we google <laughs> um you know stones like 14 pounds and like oh that's yeah. that's kind of a lot um but so he shows up a little overweight, a little undertrained, and kind of, kind of lost it the night before. And, and I'm not going to say chicken out, but went for the 24s instead of the 27s. Hits the Arnberg double, on the same wheels. On the same wheel, double fails both wheels. And you know, Velo News here in the states, they used to have a thumbs up, thumbs down uh, thing in the front of the magazine, and and I got my first thumbs down. It was <laughs> Josh and Zip. This will never work. Please stop you know, stop ruining athletes days or whatever. It was, it was heartbreaking. Um, and, and Magnus, who is just the love, I mean, he's such a lovely guy, right? You know, he actually called me and said, oh, mate, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. This isn't your fault. You know, it was just bad day. I'm a little overweight. I shouldn't have gone with the 24, like, you know, like keep, keep going. Like there's future here. And, uh, and so we kept going. Yeah. Well, just on that note, and I'll let you keep going for a minute, but I just want to into, into, lewd here is that what what is it there because you know in those times we're hearing 27 now and everyone be like well that's that's super narrow like why wouldn't you just take the risk but we've got to try and get inside the mindset here and this is something that you you sort of alluded to there that when you're breaking these wheels you need someone like a biana reese you need someone to actually back you up and go hey guys because look as as pros and i'm i'm 100 percent in on this i'm still I'm now where I'm not at the finer pointy end getting dropped or, you know, needing that one bit more just to hang on to the bunch. It doesn't matter if I go, you know, 1K faster or 1K slower now what I do as long as I feel good. So, I'm open to trying different stuff these days. When I was racing, I wasn't open as much and I needed that proof. I needed mm. to see someone win on it. I needed to see, see the even the hard data wasn't enough. I needed to feel good on the bike to convince myself. So, this is a really hard thing. So, I can- to rewind back to Magnus, that night before, I guess he's just freaked out about the rolling resistance of a bigger tire and feeling like, well, this is going to be slow. I don't care if it survives Arenberg faster. I want to be faster the whole day. Is that sort of the mentality he was getting in and why he chickened out? Yeah, I think, you know, th- th- this for me was the beginning of of my obsession with, and, and if you listen to my podcast, you hear it all the time. I, we talk about mental models, right? We we simplify the world into these mental models of of how things work. And, you know, like if you're not an engineer technician, I mean, you know, heck, even me early in my career as an engineer, like my mental models were broken, right? Because they were, they were historic and they were, uh, you know, we would say now like old wives tales, (laughs) you know, but they, those mental models get handed down. And so, you know, that was a thing where nobody really believed that arrow worked. 
But at the same time, almost everybody would tell you that a 27 was slower than a 24 because of arrow. <laughs> and, and they would do it in the same breath that they say, well, but I don't really believe in arrow, you know, um, or they would say, you know, oh, the 27 is going to have way more rolling resistance. Right. And, and again, it's just a broken mental model, but I mean that, you know, it's, it's the stuff that we fought with the tire pressure forever. Oh, lower is slower. Well, how do we know lowers? Mm. Oh, well, everybody just knows it, right? I mean, it's it's there's this model of, you know, it's all casing deflection and rolling resistance and, you know, higher is better, lower is slower, end of story. And it takes time and, and data. And then, to, to, you know, to your point, really, I mean, it takes people following the data to start winning and that's when the stuff really changes, you know? So, so I mean, to, to end the Roubaix story, like, you know, we finally get everything together. We get all this tire pressure. We, we figured out that tire pressure is one of the biggest, most important parts of this whole thing. We get Fabian on the 28s, on the 303 that we designed, the whole thing. He wins Roubaix. And I swear to God, the next year at Roubaix, every single team, I mean, even like the little French yeah. and Italian teams, they're all on carbon wheels and they're all like, oh, yes, but but of course, like the carbon wheels, you know, they they work here now. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was like, oh, my God, it it, it took, you know, Andy Horton as if, you know, always had this joke that, you know, hey, 20 years later, you're an overnight success. And and that that's literally what happened. You know, we, we beat that drum for 10 years and then finally it was like, oh, yeah, but of course. Of course, that's what, how how it works, and and you know every I think the next five years were all won on rims that we designed or made using the technology, the tire. I mean, all of the stuff that we had done there. And and as soon as I left Zip, I mean, that was to start Silka, or really to pick up the Silka brand and restart it. Um, I mean, my inbox for probably three years was just people like help us with Rubé, help us with Rubé. <laughs> and, and leading to a lot of the work that, that we do with teams now. So so in the end, it was a good thing. Before that, and I think, you know, in a similar sort of vein, there was this this period, I didn't actually know about this, only doing a little bit of research about about you, was this, I guess, missed opportunity, you'd almost call it. And another a, another writer that I really loved is Jan Ulrich. And to rewind, apparently, and I'll let you tell the story, back in 99, um, reached out to you, to chat about another sort of thing that was coming into the peloton, what wasn't in the peloton yet is ceramic bearings. Mm. Um, and this is, you know, to again, looking for those marginal gains, always yeah, the peloton's always sort of searching for the marginal gains here. Tell me a little bit about this this story here. I've, I found this so fascinating. I did not know about this story until sort of just recently and reading about it. And I was like, oh my gosh, you go right back here. And I did not know that was going on back then. Yeah, so he... He reached out, gosh, late 99, maybe early 2000 about the Olympics and, you know, you know, kind of typical his coach trainer person, um, you know, Jan really wants to target the Olympics. Um, you know, can you build him some some special super light wheels? And, you know, we had just kind of redeveloped the 303 um, at that time, you know, before it was called the 340 and it was heavy and and we really refashioned it as a, a very light. If you remember the, the rim at the time that people loved was the Mavic GL330, um, 330 gram aluminum box section mm. rim. And so my vision as a former road <laughs> road racer wannabe myself was like, if we could make an arrow, like a 38, 40 millimeter rim that weighed the same as a GL330, like we, we can, we're going to, we're going to do yeah. something here. Um, and so we'd been really driving towards that and, and we actually ended up doing it that those early rims were like 285. So, I mean, super light, a little fragile, but for, for pros, um, who tend to be a little lighter than the rest of us, um, worked great. And, um, and so we'd been working on this rim tech and they said, well, you know, if you, can you build the wheels? We've got Tune making this special hub. And, you know, Tune is one of these like mythical brands of Germany. You know, they're in the Black Forest and um, all this craftsmanship. <laughs> and and uh, Uli at Tune, you know, he's been a friend of mine for 20 plus years and he's a super, super good guy. But but the the challenge with the Tune hub was that it's two like forged flanges, like they kind of floated on a center tube. Um, which was how they got the the weight so low. And then the bearings were all press fit together. And so we get this hub and it's just notchy, you know, and I'm like, man, this is mm. this does not feel, this is not what fast feels like, you know. It's it's light, but yet yeah, the, the whole wheel's light, but it doesn't roll fast. It didn't, yeah, it didn't roll, you know, and I, I don't want to ride this wheel with 
you know, these bearings in it. And so I was just, you know, a year out of school. And one of my uh, engineering friends from school had gone on to work for Timken Bearing, which he had told me was making some sort of bearing for like some fuel pump assembly in the space shuttle. And so he had, you know, been like, dude, there's these ceramic balls in it, like, you know, 30,000 RPM. The inertia is so high that the steel balls like go like wonky and the ceramics can, and, you know, I'm just fascinated by this. First, I'd ever heard of ceramic bearings. And so I ring him and said, hey, you know, we we have a chance to, we're building this Olympic wheel set for a guy who could very feasibly win it. Um, what can we do with the bearings? And he said, oh yeah, our, the micro miniature bearing we do is the company in Switzerland called WIB, um, W-I-B, and and they use the, you know, they assemble the bearings with the best subcomponents and whatever. And so we we did it. And you know, first, to my knowledge, cycling wheel set with ceramic bearings, and um, he wins the Olympics, and we were pretty excited. And so the next year, we did a, a wheel we called the Z3, and we made it expensive. And and you know, these ceramic bearings are a fortune. And so people would say, why is it so expensive? Like, well, these bearings are crazy. And so, kind of to drive the point home, you know, we had this like spare parts list in the zip catalog, and it was you know, brake pads, quick release, right? All these like ten to twenty dollar items, and I'm like. I want you to put ceramic bearing upgrade right in the middle of that at twelve hundred dollars. Mm. So it just People jumps off the understand. page. Is like, yeah. like this is why that wheel set is expensive. And we did it, and you know, we we sold a few hundred sets, and and we had some people who were real fans of it. And then, uh, but yeah, that was kind of all I, I don't know, I didn't think all that much more of it. And then, yeah, like two years later at the Tour de France, met Jakob at Ceramic Speed. And kind of looked around and was like, oh, shit, he's built an entire <laughs> business around this idea. Like, oh, man, we totally missed this boat. You know, I, I just thought mm. nobody would ever spend that money on that thing. And um, wow, was I wrong. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I'd call that like my biggest, uh, probably my biggest business error <laughs> in my career. Well, to help me, help us understand what what when when it get, comes to bike riding, and you know, obviously we're not going as fast as sort of a a, a pump that's you know, in a, in a rocket going to the moon. Why is ceramic bearings much better when it comes to a wheel hub? You know, just for the gomads out there. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're honest, you know, they're not they're not much better. They're a little bit better. You know, I mean, they're they're really the definition of marginal gains. You know, a uh, uh, that twelve hundred dollar bearing upgrade. I mean, when we did all the testing and really refined it, I think it was like 0.8 watts faster than the the bearings we were replacing. Um, so I think you know that that's maybe the thing that's been lost in, in kind of the future of that business is you know it it really is a lot of money for not a huge amount of savings. Um, mm. You know, you think of all the things out there that are 0.8 watts, right? It's like one wrinkle in a skin suit is at least 0.8 watts, you know, a uh, mm. badly pinned number is probably one and a half, uh, you know, the arrow socks for 30 bucks can save you 15, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so I think if, if we're putting it in sort of the pantheon of like, you know, cost benefit, it's, it's not that I th- thought it couldn't work. I just never th- imagined that it could work as a, as a standalone business. And, and again, you know, holy smokes, I was completely wrong. I mean, they've ceramic speed and, and who are, great friends of mine. I love them. But, you know, they've built an empire on this thing. And there's probably six other companies that are very successful, very large ceramic bearing upgrade providers of all sorts. And, um, you know, the the, the thing, the, the idea is that they're more round, right? You think of the the harder the material, the more round you can make it and the better you can polish it. And so like the top, like the one millionth uh, inch ceramic bearings, they're actually, they're magnetically floated and polished while floating in this like ultra strong magnet. It's called magnetic float polishing, super cool technology. Um, and you know, you can just make it so they're rounder and then they're harder. And so it's kind of back to like, you know, a lot of air pressure in your tire. If, if you can get really beautiful, high polished races, um, and these really hard, really round balls, you can save a few tenths of a watt. Um, you know, now the other thing that I think a lot of people don't think about with them, and this is the where I think I see people getting a little bit caught up or caught out with the technology is like when you see the video, you know, you flick it with the finger and it spins forever. Well, that's because there's non-contact seals and there's no grease in them. Um, and to last, you need grease. Um, and then really, 
you need seals. And so I think that's the thing. If you look at like a lot of the popular, you know, like oversized pulley wheel upgrades and things, they really do save you that one and a half, 1.8 watts, you know, that they claim and that's legit, but they really also need to be maintenance, you know, like probably pop the shields off and like, like wash them, flush them out and, and re-lubricate them every three to 500 K and, and who's doing that, <laughs> you know? So I think that's, that's the balance there. And, um, you know, and, and again, the things that made me think, I don't think anybody's going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come now to sort of where we crossed over in paths, and I think it was around 2019. And actually, you know, I'd completely forgotten about this because I was in another another world, and I'd completely forgotten about my bike. Um, yeah, I flew in to Roubaix 2019. I arrive at the hotel, and the team's gone to me. Right, oh, Mitch. Um, well, let me set this up for my own defense here. <laughs> okay, this is, I love this story. 99% of the time, you travel without a bike as a pro because the team takes your bike in the in the truck and they arrive at the race and then you have your training bike at home and you just fly without a bike and you get there and your race bike's there, primed, ready to go. This occasion, I came from another race. I can't remember where I was, but I had to come with my race bike. And so- it was abnormal for me flying with a race bike. So I got off the plane, jumped in the car, and I went to the airport. And the team, like I said, to pick up where I was, right, Mitch, where's that race bike? Let's unpack it. And I'm like, oh, the race bike. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess that's still going around the carousel back at uh, Brussels. And uh, I guess this is where you pick up. And uh, what was your job there? And, you know, not speaking necessarily about marginal gains oh, here. We're talking man. about just gains here, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. No, that that was yeah. So I, you know, one of the the things I've done for for years, and I really enjoy doing, is you, you know, I think the progressive directors like Andreas at EF, you know, will you know have pull me or pull us in for tire pressure testing or or you know sometimes just equipment validation things like that and so the, the team that year had a ton of stuff going on i mean you had these new prototype victoria tires had these new inserts that nobody had tried before um we were really trying to figure out do the inserts change the pressure you know i mean just uh, all these unknowns and so he'd called me and i'd flown in for that and yeah i was i was with the mechanics and and the guys when you showed up and you know, I don't think we'd ever met before that. And and I'm standing there just feeling like, you know, it's, it's like that thing where you just feel so like awkward for other people. You know, I'm like, oh, God, this poor guy, you know, because because I, I know it like, you know, your your job isn't tending to a bike and remember to be like, you, you know, one of the things that it took me a while to really learn about the athletes, right, is like, you know, they're in their own world, right? You're the center of your own world and you you're juggling and tending to all these things that are in your brain and it just really makes it hard to focus on the other stuff you know and so um you know like early in my career i would you know would kind of preach like look guys here's the data just do what the data you know and like mm. oh they're not listening because they don't and so it's really changed my approach to you know how we try to get athletes on board with with new technology and and one of the big challenges is you know especially when you're at a race like you're not thinking about the technology like, you know, you didn't forget your bike because you were thinking like, should I have been at 4.7 bar or 4.8? Hmm, I'm really twisted up. A bit. Like, that's not what you're, you don't care. Um, and and so, yeah, so I was working with JJ, who's love him to death, a great mechanic. And uh, I'm like, oh, like, JJ, I'll go with you. Let, let's just go get his bike. And and the whole way there, we're joking about like, like, all right, if they pulled it off or is it just spinning around on the, on the carousel? <laughs> and of course, they pulled it off. And, um, and, and then the funniest thing is we, we get there and, you know, it's in your name and, and they're like, you know, you're not Mitch Docker. And we're like, like, yeah, but look, we have all the clothes. Like, look, we have, like, we're wearing all the clothing <laughs> of the team. Give us that like 25,000 euro bike exactly. now. <laughs> it was like one of those, those really, the, the next awkward moment. And thank goodness they, they let us have it and, um, and, and brought it back, but. No, I just, I, I just, I love moments like that, right? Because it, it humanizes the whole thing and it really, yeah. And that's, that's why I wanted to bring it up because, you know, that that's a big factor of what you do. Um, and I want to have a chat about Silka in a minute, but, you know, part of your business is, and you can tell me a little bit about this, is actually consulting to teams. And you alluded to that a little bit, is that, you know, often teams, you know, they're working with a lot of different companies, a lot of them at the very pointy end, some of them not. 
they're all trying to produce and also tell the story that they've got the next best thing or they've got the best, you know, equipment to, to offer. Mm-hmm. And they need that to be presented on the world stage to ultimately trickle down and sell and blah, blah, blah. But I guess as a team, you just you can't necessarily question them if you don't know if that's true or not. You know, they might have the resources behind them as the sponsor to test it. But as a team, you don't have those resources. You don't have the money to go out and do individual testing. So I guess is that sort of where you come in and teams reach out and go, look, we're not trying to question our sponsors. We just want to know, are we running with the best stuff in certain times? Or when do they reach out? When is these times that you have to come on board? When you're not, you know, when you're not working with a specific company like say Zip and coming in because Zip mm. sponsored CSC. So now this is taken to a new level. Yeah, I think the the directors who really get it understand that they can't risk losing the athlete's confidence in the product. And and so I would say it's it's when that starts to be in doubt people will call us, you know, I mean, some, sometimes they call us with, um, you know, like so-and-so wants to do an hour record and we want to put the best package together, you know, start from, whatever from zero, right? Like whatever that looks like. And, and, you know, that's one thing, but it's not common, but it happens. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, the best example I use, that's not our sport. Um, so I can talk a little bit more freely cause I wasn't involved, but if you remember a few years back, you know, Under Armour got the contract for the USA speed skating suits and they developed this, you know, super exotic suit. It's, you know, whatever, $10,000 a suit. And of course, and the athletes go out and they're not putting up good times and very quickly, I mean, within like one or two average performances, the athletes are like, it's the suit. The suit sucks. Oh, the suit is terrible. And Mm. Under Armour just completely lost the faith of the team. And in subsequent data and testing, the suit actually was was pretty fast. It it almost certainly wasn't the suit, but that kind of breakdown in the trust of the equipment really led the whole team to, I mean, in a a sense, like self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like we're, Mm. we don't think we can perform at these you know, hit these numbers that we're planning to hit. And so you you don't. And, you know, that stuff happens in cycling as well. And so, you know, we've absolutely had, um, you know, last Olympic cycle, not this one, we had one of the federations reach out and say, you know, the the riders don't like the bike that the sponsor gave us. They don't trust it. And you know, will you will you test it? And so we went and did the testing of the bike and actually found out that it was slightly faster than the um, sponsor had had even told them that it was. And, you know, I think it was a matter of, I won't tell you who it was, but it was not the British. So I think these, this team showed up and they saw the new, if you like, the, that was the very beginning of the British bikes with the super wide, you know, four yeah, legs. Four. Stays. Yeah. And they're looking at their bike that looked pretty normal, traditional. <laughs> pretty traditional. Yeah. And they're like, this bike stinks. And they started to lose confidence. And so we can come in, we can do some wind tunnel, we can do track testing, we can put all the data together. And then when you go back to them and go, no, 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 like it, this bike is, is you know, I, I don't have their bike to test it against, but this bike- But it is fast. It's faster than the bike you had last time. And, you know, and you can really start to build that confidence back. Um, so, yeah, I would say, you know- it's really a mix of that. And, and, you know, guys like, um, you know, Andreas at EF or, you know, Dan Bigum at NEO. So, you know, they, they really get this. And, and I think they really understand that as, as much as it's about technology and, you know, the guys like me want to make it all about the technology. If, if the riders don't believe mm. it or they don't want to be riding it, or they think there's some problem with it, then none of these marginal, you know, everything is so good right now that, even the bigger marginal gains are easily offset by a loss of confidence in the rider. Mm, a psychological effect. Yeah. Like I, I can only think back to, I don't know whether you were um, involved with this at all at, at EF, but you know, when, when the System 6 was brought in from Cannondale and it was as a slightly heavier bike, I want to say, you know, high eights, even maybe nine kilo fully set up and we were trying to strip it down you know looking at different things lighter bottle cages different bars i know simon clark even rode without bar tape in one race to save a bit and one bottle cage and all this sort of stuff because you know from what we're understanding from cannondale this bike was very fast at a point you know when it got to 15 kilometers an hour or above this was the fastest bike you could possibly ride the problem was we we tested it in a giro and you know, the first race we did was in a hard mountain race mm. and, you know, mountainous race that 
all of us got dropped, whether that was because of the bike or whether it was not all of us, but a lot of us got dropped, you know, the sprinters using it. And we just pretty much wrote it off exactly what you said. And it was like this fulfilling prophecy where everyone just went, it's the bike. It's I'm suffering on this bike. And the only way that I was eventually convinced was I had all the data in front of me and I had all these guys preaching at me, but I felt it in the race. I wasn't sold. It was until I had the bike at home and I was training on it. And I did the same loop in Girona that I've always done, whatever it was, a three-hour loop. And you knew door to door when you did your efforts, whatever, it was three hours and one minute, it was 2.59, somewhere within that vicinity. All of a sudden, I was getting home 15 minutes faster from the first one. I'm like, oh, that's strange. Must have had a good day. Next week, same again, 20 minutes yeah. faster. I'm like, then guys kept going to me, mate, stop half-wheeling me. <laughs> stop. You're, you're really annoying to train with. How come you're going so fast? I'm like- Something's going on here. And fr- suddenly I was convinced. It was on my own terms yeah, that I got yeah. convinced. So I guess the question out of all this is that for me as a pro, and then once you know, we talked about riders winning on it, but before we get to that phase, you have to have a, a buy-in from the pros. Mm. What is your sort of tactic, I guess, or the way that you do it, whether is it convincing the sports directors and then hand it over, hey, that's your job, you sell it, or are you part of that selling process to the riders? We can be both. I mean, I, ideally, you know, we would come in early enough that we have time to to allow that to happen. You know, so I mean, talk, go back to the the three hundred threes at Roubaix. You know, we for 09, once we knew we had a wheel that wouldn't break and a and the tire size needed to be twenty eight, um, we started that season with a wind tunnel test, and we took you know Fabian and Nikki and all those guys to the wind tunnel, and we put them on the uh, God, what was the the steel Cervelo was replaced R two five. So there was a steel Cervelo, the Prodigy, then the R two five, and we put them on that with the classic wheels, and then we put them on the bike with the aero wheels, and they could see their data, right? And then you know, so you're kind of building again the mental model, and then we followed that up with a test, you know, at Roubaix in the Arnberg, then we did the care for, right? I mean, you, you do the thing. And, and the thing I kept really trying to like plant in their mind from that wind tunnel test was, you know, it was probably the other clever thing we did. That was the year uh, Tom Bonin was on uh, Eddie Merck's mm. bikes when they were not the best designed carbon bikes out there. We'll just say that they were one of the transitions of the Eddie Merck's brand. And this thing had like a, like a, 68 millimeter wide flat down tube. I mean, it was just aerodynamically, it was just like everything you could do wrong. They're like, let's do that. Um, <laughs> and and we knew he'd be, be riding 32 spoke box section wheels. And so we had bought one of these bikes and we put those wheels on it and we put Fabian in the tunnel on that bike next to the bike he'd just been on. And the Delta was as big as Fabian's Delta from his road bike to his TT bike. And so the whole time we just kept saying like, dude, you're essentially compared to Bonin, you're on a time trial bike. I mean, it, you know, I think the numbers when we, we did all the stuff, I think the arrow was 40 Watts with the tire pressure stuff. It all rolled up to be like 70 Watts. And wow. we just kept saying, you know, like he's on 70, a, 70. Yeah. It was crazy. And we just kept saying like Bonin is on a, a bike that is slower than the Eddie Merckx era bikes. Right. <laughs> and you're on the equivalent of a, of a time trial bike. So, mm. and you just build that in, right? And then you run them through and, you know, we, I mean, we did stupid stuff. Like he was worried, well, you know, if, if we go test in the Arnberg, it's, it's not like the race in the race we hit, you know, mm. 55 K an hour. And so, you know, we brought in a scooter, right? We motor paced him into the Arnberg at 55 K an hour and didn't break the wheels. And, um, and so, you know, it just, I mean, it, it's a real building process. And, and even then we, we really lucked out that he almost like almost chickened out that morning. And he is, I heard the story from him, uh, Tor Hushoff, uh, a test team rode by and was on the, the 303s that year. And he went, Oh shit. <laughs> like, like it kind of all clicked. Like, like, you know, I think it it's one thing. It's one thing to not have an advantage if you think there's no disadvantage. Right. So I think, you know, if he's thinking and, and we see this with the track guys all the time, you know, there's a lot of like track stuff that's 
it, well, it's changing now, but, you know, the guys would say like, well, you know, I want to run the wheel that everyone else is running because, you know, I may not have an advantage, but I know I'm not at a disadvantage. Mm. But the second- The risk. They don't want to take a, a massive yeah, risk. Yeah, there's yeah. a risk, you know, and, and we're humans, right? There's a real asymmetry with risk, right? You'd way rather, or you, you, it hurts far more to lose $5 than it feels good to win $5. Right. I mean, we, we know that. And it's human psychology. Yeah. You think just to the Olympics now, the, the four years, say, oh, the four years I've put to this, all the sacrifice, the effort and the training. And suddenly it might be just the technology that lets me down. I have this doubt in it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and so, you know, the, it, it really drives this risk aversion. And, and, you know, thank goodness for us, you know, he because he said, I almost didn't, I almost didn't do it. Mm. And then Tor rolled by and, it, and for him, it clicked of like, Oh, I'm at a disadvantage. Oh. What what if it works? What what if what if he can beat me because he's got them and I don't? And um and it changes everything. And so I you know I think certainly for me it it's through my career has been a real process of kind of merging the technology with the psychology um you know around this and and really realizing that oh gosh, you know and and like I said I I think a lot of what we're working on now are relatively marginal gains. I mean, you know, you think back to the the CSC era, you know, having an aero bike and aero wheels compared to non-aero bikes and and box section wheels was massive. I mean, it was 70 massive. watts. Like we're talking huge, you know, that's yeah. We're not talking a half a watt. Yeah. And and now a lot of the stuff we're working on is a watt here and a watt there, you know, or a couple there. And and you know, it it Again, if you it, you just have to find that tipping point of a couple riders with success. I mean, you know, aero socks were one of those things. That, and as much as I hate um, mm. to say it, you know, I, I'm no I'm no massive fan of tall aero socks visually, but they work. And once people are winning with them, you got to do it right. And and you know, the turned in brake levers, like I again, I think it looks terrible. But it works. And and we're there now with narrow bars. You know, we've been talking about that for a couple of years on our channel. That guys, I hate to say it, but narrow bars are so much faster that you can't not be riding them and and you know, doing what you want to be doing. And and you look at the Peloton today and everybody's on the narrow bars. And so again, it's that 20 years later, you're an overnight success, right? It's some of these things are years in the making, and then it just takes one a gotcha riding 165 cranks, and all of a sudden everybody's like Oh yeah, oh, yeah oh. of course. One sixty five. Yeah, totally. That works, you know. And, and, <laughs> and you know, for the last twenty five or more years, people have been like, "That's crazy. That'll never work." Um, <laughs> you know. So there's there's a million things like that. Another thing, another really exciting thing that's uh, that's going on with you, um, which has been which has been happening since you took over the company in about two thousand and thirteen, I think it was, um, Silka. And Silka, look, it's it's a brand that we've known. I think it's been in the in the bike industry since you know early 19, 19, 1917. Oh, 1917. Yeah, I was going to say nineteen oh seven. It's been around for ages, and it's been in the family. One of the oldest, you know, companies owned by the one family, and eventually it came to a point where, you know, it sort of disappeared for a while and was just sort of hovering along there. But it's been reborn, um, and it's been reborn with you. And one of the the amazing things that's going on now, I want to talk about firstly the the takeover of that that business and and why you thought, you know, I think it, it essentially was taking over the the name and, and continuing on what they'd started way back then. But is what's happened with what you've done with with Lube and Wax, and that is something that I think you were talking about their marginal gains. But this is something that I think is overlooked. Where it's it's maybe bordering on you know more than a marginal gain, but let's talk about Silka first and that exciting sort of rebirth of a of a fantastic company. Yeah, yeah I mean that was really transformative for me. You know, I, I so SRAM bought Zip in like two thousand eight, um, and I kind of stayed on as what they called category manager, and then became was too many spreadsheets and businessy stuff, and so I went back into you know, like technical management and, um, you know, was, was having a good time there, but, you know, I, I used to joke at, at, you know, making carbon wheels, it was like, you know, we're just making the same dinner over and over again. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you make a little bit deeper one or a little bit, whatever, but you know, it, 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 I was looking for something else and I really enjoyed, you know, some of the teams I was on for around SRAM product and, um, some of the, you know, 
carbon composite things I did there, but it was just looking for something different. And um, Claudio Sacchi, the the then owner of Silka, he was the grandson of the founder. And he, I'd known him for 20 years from the Zip experience because we'd always bought the little uh, disc wheel valve adapters, the, the crack pipes, as we call them from him. And uh, <laughs> And and so he sent me an email and and just said, hey, you know, I I have pancreatic cancer. They give me six months. I've been trying to sell the company for a year, and nobody wants to buy it. You know, do you know anybody? And thought, you know, like, oh God, how sad. You know, and I I mean, my first pump when I was fifteen was a Silka. I love the brand. I've always been friends with Claudio. Just such a lovely guy. And um, I, I remember. <laughs> Kind of going to bed that night thinking like, wow, who would be dumb enough to buy a bankrupt Italian company that makes pumps, hmm. right? When we've got all these fancy, hmm. shiny silver pumps coming out of China, you know, half the price and the whole thing. And and then, you know, as the next couple of weeks went on, it was like these data points of like, gosh, you know, last time we went to the tunnel, we actually lost two hours of tunnel time because we broke, we'd broken both of our fancy, shiny silver Chinese. Wow. Bank. You know, like, why doesn't anybody make a valve extender that just, you know, works? Works. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> you know, and, and it kind of hit me, like, the bar on some of this stuff is pretty low. You know, like the the disc wheel adapter that Silka made. I mean, I had 10 ideas on how to make it better. Like, you know, but I mean, you know, when I was at Zip, it's like, am I going to burn engineering hours on a valve adapter or on making in the next wheel? Well, the next wheel. Mm. Like, oh, I, you know, probably two weeks went by and I bet I had 10 product ideas. And um, yeah, so I thought, hey, somebody somebody's needs to do it, needs to save this brand. And so, you know, we were able to get, by the time I got there, um, all that was left was just the trademark. And so, mm. you know, the Italian government had sort of taken all the assets and they had all, you know, disappeared as I think happens in those situations and um, were probably used to pay whatever debts and the trademark was left. And so we were able to buy that. And yeah, 2014. So that was end of 2013. And then 2014, yeah, I started actually right at this desk I'm sitting at right now. Um, I had a piece of paper with a trademark on it and a laptop. And that was the beginning of the company. And, um, you know, started redeveloping, redesigning all the old pumps, but with new kind of engineering and materials. And, um, and then, like I said, you know, people were coming out of the woodwork like, oh, you know, help us with this, help us with that. And mm. I, I had done a lot of stuff with uh, wax-based chain lubes back in the day with CSC. Actually, you know, we would kind of homebrew these hot wax concoctions for the tour time trials and, you know, Olympic time trial, things like that. And um, and so, yeah, that's where like a lot of the ideas just start to come from. Um, you know, we did pumps and then we grew into tools, and then we grew into bags. But you wanted to keep it that the traditional way that they'd already done it. You know, you didn't want to necessarily re you know reinvent the wheel you yeah i guess sort of reinvent the wheel in a way you wanted to make the traditional products but you know tweak it and and, and bring it up to speed but keep that like you said they're, they're they're metal the pumps are metal the quality's there you know yeah i mean it was super exciting in the beginning for me right because i you know everything i'd ever made was somewhat exotic you know carbon and and mm. ceramics and all this stuff but really all of that was designed to be obsoleted by the next year's product um, and so, you know, I, I think there was certainly a moment I had where it was like, like, wow, everything I've ever really worked on is probably in a landfill somewhere because I've made the thing that, you know, surpassed it. And uh, yeah, and with Silco, it was like, wow, this is, what if I take their kind of heirloom quality, you know, last forever? I mean, you know, these Silco pumps, my God, people come to us with, oh, I've got a 30, 40, 50 year old pump, 60 year old pump. Mm. Um, and they're still rebuildable. People still use them. And I mm. love that idea of like, wow, what if we took that ethos, kind of that mentality, and then we merged it with some of the modern engineering practices and, you know, CAD design and machining and 3D printing and these other things, you know, we could really have some fun, like, and, and we could make products that are built to last forever, um, but also do it with some of this, this tech. And, you know, it's funny, I've <laughs> done some like, talks with you know business school students and stuff and like well you know how, how do you how do you know anybody would ever buy this stuff what's the market research and like the market research is me like you know would i spend my you know that pump is 500 bucks would i spend 500 dollars on that pump and you know if you can look yourself in the mirror and say yes i would spend my own money on that eh, there's got to be more of us right <laughs> right i'm not one of one um 
And, and so that, that was really where it started. Yeah. I love what you said there that the realization of, hang on, we're actually losing time here in, in, you know, whatever it is to do a wind tunnel test per hour. And we're wasting time on, on a pump that I thought was going to be good quality. This is, I love that realization of, actually, if I just get a good pump, we can save money here. You know, that, that, that was sort of yeah. crazy to me. I want to talk about wax chain lube, you know, in, in this whole umbrella, because this is, this is something that we were chatting about a few months ago. And being a complete idiot, I was always, you know, I uh, didn't really know much about it. Dry lube's sort of pretty good because it doesn't get all greasy on my chain and all this sort of stuff. Wax, who even uses wax? You know, I didn't even know that we were using wax in the team. I just thought, oh, we've got these cool chains that had this white stuff on it. I don't know what that does. It makes us go faster, you know. You were really blowing my mind and, and helping me understand, you know, when it comes to lubing a chain, you know, whether we're just trying to, you know, beat the hour record or whether we're just actually trying to preserve our chain and not have to buy a brand new chain every six months to a year because we're just training around, you know, in, in the neighborhood here. Tell me a little bit about lube. I'll just put mm. that out there, lubricant, wax, and help us understand what's going on there. Yeah. So you know, one of the things I love about this category and, and really high quality lubricant is it it really is a one of the rare spaces where you almost there's no trade-offs right so you think of like you know the traditional things you think of like you know weight versus arrow like you're kind of on a continuum and you're picking one or the other like oh more arrows mm -hmm. more surface area but then there's going to be more weight you know tire pressure is the other one right the optimal tire pressure you know, is not only faster, but it handles better and it's less wearing mm. on the tire and it corners faster. And you're know, like, what's the downside? There's none. You just have to pay attention. And and lubricants are another one of those that you think of the fastest lubricant is the thing that keeps the metal from ever touching other metal. Well, if the metal is never touching the other metal, it's also never wearing, right? And it also is going to be pretty quiet. And so, you know, it's a category where you really can you know, have your cake and eat it too, uh, in a yeah. sense that the, the, the right or the perfect lubricant will be the fastest lubricant that also is the lowest wearing, um, and the quietest. And, you know, wax really is the closest thing we have to a perfect lubricant in uh, a roller chain. Um, and so, you know, you think of the roller chain as a, actually a really complicated thing. You know, every chain is 116 links, give or take, each of those links is two outer plates, two inner plates, um, a pin, a roller, right? And, and multiplied out. So, I mean, a lot of parts. And then it's under these incredible loads and pressures. So, I mean, it, it, the pin to the, the bushing interface um, under like at a 250 watt load, you're seeing over 100,000 PSI uh, at the, wow. the surface of the pin. So, I mean, incredible so what, what's loads. happening in like, like a track standing start? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the pressures just go crazy, right? And, and Wow. And so, you know, you need a lubricant that can hold up to this. And I think it's really counterintuitive to people that a solid, like wax, can do this. But when you really get down into the, the science and the chemistry of it, it's kind of like ice skating. You think of how, like, the ice is super hard, and then the pressure of the skate blade makes it liquefy. And now you have oh. this super efficient, you're actually gliding on liquid water. Right. That's basically what's happening in a waxed chain that you're under those extreme pressures. You're just locally liquefying oh. um, the wax in that spot for that moment. And then it's hard again. And uh, and that allows you to withstand these crazy high pressures. Um, but it also because all of the negative space, the nooks and crannies are all full of this solid wax, the dirt isn't getting in. And so, you know, what's really killing the chain more so than the, the loads and pressures is that you put dirt inside of that thing or allow it to be wicked in by like an oil based lube. And now you've created a grinding paste that's exposed to these extreme pressures and mm. you're just grinding the metal apart. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a fascinating um, super geeky thing. You know, we, we work with a lab uh, at Purdue University here in Indiana, who, who super famous as like a top five engineering school in the US and graduated more astronauts than anywhere else. And they actually have a, a la sports engineering lab that studies, um, you know, chain friction and trainer. Yep. Uh, it, they work a lot with the UCI and, and we work very closely with them. And yeah, when you really get down to the, you know, how, how it wets out the metal, what the metal... Um, 
you know, the surface roughness is what, you know, that affects how we create the additives. I mean, it, you know, totally tickles all the like super nerdy parts <laughs> of my brain. Um, <laughs> but yeah, when you, when you get down to it, I mean, you, you know, roller chains are insanely efficient, uh, which is why they've worked on bicycles forever. But the level that we're able to take them to now, I mean, we, we see on the track, we're seeing near 99% efficiency. Uh, with waxed, properly treated, you know, kind of polished, like all, you know, pulling out all the stops, um, you can get pretty close to 99. But, you know, in a, a top end drivetrain, we're in the high 97s. Um, that's crazy efficient. Uh, so why why are we not seeing more companies follow this trend or even, you know, more bike pro teams use it? Are they are they nervous about it? Is it expense? What What is it? So if there's a downside, it's that it's different. Um, and that you do have to take the chain well to to hot wax the better of the wax uh, technologies you have to take the chain off the bike. Um, I would say, and certainly from the teams that we're working with, I mean, I, I don't think there was a stage one at the tour this year on not a wax chain. <laughs> I mean, wow. every chain, like pretty much every Olympic medal has been won on a wax chain. Um, and, and, you know, not, not saying that all of it was mine. I mean, mine or somebody else's, um, it, it's absolutely the state of the art of the technology right now. And, you know, there's, there's definitely teams out there, um, who, you know, don't have the sponsor to, to can provide the product, don't have the money to buy from someone like us, but, you know, we, I think we have five customer world tour teams right now. Um, you know, who are taking some sponsors money and then buying wax chains from us. Um, and, and I know that they're doing that from the other, you know, ceramic speed is, is absolutely selling to teams that they don't sponsor. Cause I see their chains on bikes. So they buy their chains fully waxed and then what, just change their chains over or reach or re Yeah, they them? just use them. And I, I think for most teams, you're using them on critical days, right? So, you know, a lot of the teams we work with will sell, you know, hundred, 200 chains a year. Um, you know, you're clearly that you're not using 200 chains for the entire season, um, but they do save them and, and pull them out for Roubaix and, you know, the key time trials, a lot of the tour stages, you might have one, um, one rider, you know, on wax for all the stages. Um, you know, we, we were really thrilled. We just announced, I think a week or two ago when it finally could all be talked about that we're coming on as the official chain lubricant of Visma. Uh, oh. you know, which is good. And, and, you know, they're super chain close. Chain waxer. Chain wax. Yeah. And so we're now working to help them develop systems um, to, to wax every rider every day. And, and in a lot of ways for me, it feels a lot like my, my vision of carbon wheels at zip, right? I want every rider yeah. on carbon wheels every day. And now I want every rider on a wax chain every day. And, um, and, and the hang up there is, you know, the mechanics are used to doing what they've always done. And so, you know, just like the riders, this is new and it's different and it's a little scary. Um, and, and then you have very real hurdles like, well, we don't have a waxing, a wax melting system on the truck. Okay. The well, boss. Yeah. yeah. The truck, and so, yeah. and so, you know, a lot of it is solving those logistics problems. You know, where do we, where do we store it? Uh, how long does it take to heat up? How long does it take to cool down? Uh, where do we hang the chains? How do we keep track of which chain goes with which bike, you know? Because uh, especially with the gearing, you might have different lengths of chain by a link or two, you know. Um, so how often would they need to wax it? Is it every day or is it every week? Um, it, you, you get about 300, 300 to 350K per waxing. So, you know, I think a lot of our like, wow. teams this year at the tour were, you know, maybe every other day. Um and, and a lot of them are just taking, like, we're waxing the chain. We we also do a, a pretty cool diamond slurry polish where it's actually ridiculous. We, so you take nanoscale diamond, and we've got about a probably five centimeter deep bed of this in a ultra powerful ultrasonic cleaner. And you sink the chain in this. It's kind of like sand, but it's diamond. And you ultrasonically run it and pump this like Mike submicron diamond powder through the chain. And, and what it does is it gives you an insanely consistent surface finish in terms of, you think of, you know, lubricants don't want polished surface. They want very controlled, tiny scratches so that the lubricant and the additives in the lubricant can kind of hang onto that surface. So it's like, if you're, 
a car guy at all, you know, when you like you don't polish a cylinder bore, you hone it with a stone to get a very precise um, mm. kind of a scratch to it that can both bear the load, but also hold the lubricant. And uh, and so we do we do a process where we uh, diamond polish the the chains like that, and then we wax them for the team. And and you know, for the last couple of tours, we've got like I said probably five world tour teams that yeah we drive around with a bunch of we pre polish everything, wax it. And then we follow them around and we take the chains every day and we rewax them and then give them back to them. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, which it's is just yeah. In, insane. Like you think about yourself, everyone's probably listening at home going, what am I even doing <laughs> putting <laughs> putting lube on my chain here now? Like, look, to bring it back to us, I guess, um, riding at home every day, you know, clearly you're not rewaxing it. If, if you are waxing your chain, you know, which is great. You're probably not re-waxing your chain every 300k. There is a long-term effect of waxing your chain, and you can just keep rolling on. If you if it, if you had to choose between lube and wax, um, tell me about the long-term effects of waxing. If you're just at home, you know, because investing in it is more expensive, but actually in the long run, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, we also make a drip wax. I think I think we're the only system. We've got a hot melt dip and a uh, drip on. Uh, emulsified wax and the wax drip emulsion is the same stuff that's in the hot melt. So like if, you know, you can just use the drip or you can hot melt and then use the drip to kind of top off as we say. And the, the, the drip on, you probably get 200 to 250 K. Um, so, you know, you're, you know, like for my personal, I commute to work every day on an e-bike. I hot wax that thing probably every thousand miles and I drip in between because it's just easy. Um, you know, I think a, people have different systems like that, but you you can also just go with drip wax. You just have to apply it more frequently um, than the hot melt. And, you know, one of the dirty secrets of oil-based lubes, and and we, we actually make the world's best, not me saying it, but zero friction cycling, independently tested world's best oil-based lube. Um, Oil-based lubes are have amazing longevity, but the problem with them is they hide when they're broken down, right? So you have this sort of like viscoelastic sound damping effect of oil that even when it's dirty and it's acting as a grinding paste and it's it's slow and it's grinding your chain, it's still quiet. And so you think it's good and you're just killing your chain. Um, and because people all the time will say like, oh, I tried your wax, but, you know, you're you're synergetic. I get a thousand miles between applications and say, so like, well, so you think it's good. I yeah. know you think you can go a thousand between applicate, but eh, that's probably not right. Um, and Adam at Zero Friction has a ton of really fascinating you know, data to take you through how this works and why. Hmm. But, yeah, I mean, it, you think now the the you can easily get 15 to 20,000 K on a wax chain um, because there's almost, if you're waxing it consistently and taking care of it, dirt's not getting in to make the grinding paste um, and the metal's never touching the metal. And so the things last forever. Well, if your chain isn't wearing out, then your cassette isn't wearing out and your chain rings are wearing out. And, you know, my God, I mean, I, if you saw like the, the SRAM red axis explorer, so many words in that thing that was just launched. I mean, a beautiful Grupo. Mm. Um, that chain is like two hundred dollars, and the cassette is, I think, seven hundred, six eighty or something U.S. dollars. Um, so you know, if you, if you can double or triple the life expectancy of the chain and the the cassette and the chain rings, you know, that twenty five fifty dollars a lube is saving you thousands of dollars in parts, right? And let alone pedal that 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 bit easier, whether it's you know racing your main in the bunch or just just getting to work a little bit easier. Look, I guess. Let's talk about very quickly, and you're probably going to struggle with this, but looking at road racing now, we've seen a big shift in tires. Um, and, you know, I guess the, the ultimate question is now, what is the optimal? You know, we're thinking about the world tour, whether you're doing your local club race or, you know, what if you can have the optimum tire size and setup, what are we looking at now? We spoke about, you know, back in the day, we're talking about 19s, you know, 19 mil they were racing on. When I raced Roubaix for the first time, we went up to 23. It felt huge. Oh, my God, we're riding the big tyres. I wouldn't even ride a 23 mil tyre ever now. Um, you know, at the end of Roubaix, I was riding a 30, which felt re very big. Are the guys going to go up from there? Are they going to come back? Let's move away from Roubaix. Let's just talk about normal road racing. What are we seeing as the optim optimum tyre? size and I guess set up these days. 
Yeah, I have said for a number of years, I I think where we end up ultimately is in this like 32 range. Um, With pro racing, you are going fast enough that there's absolutely aero penalty to these wider tires. Um, You know, for the the riding that, you know, I'm doing and, and, you know, the, the not racing that we're all doing, the you can argue that there's typically a little bit of a rolling resistance benefit to the wider tire and we're not going fast enough to really be penalized by the arrow. But of course you look at these speeds, the world tour guys are riding. Absolutely. You also start to see some pretty significant weight penalties as you start getting up bigger than 32. Um, And a lot of that is just the tire as it becomes, has this larger diameter, it's presenting more of its tread and its carcass to the ground with a lower angle of tangency, essentially. And so the tread has to be quite a bit wider to prevent sidewall cutting. And so there's a sort of like nonlinear weight gain as these tires get bigger to to not risk these sidewall cuts. Um, So it's hard for me to see bigger than 32 really working in road racing with with the technologies we have today you know clearly something could come and change that are we seeing because i I was rolling around the tour de france this year and i was going up to the team cars and having a look at the sidewalls and often you get a a fake number on there anyway and there's difference in numbers between we started that by the way different tire brands but Oh yeah, did you? Totally. We started that. <laughs> uh, don't want anyone else um, to know what's and up. also the the measuring of tires is slightly different between companies too. So look, I often saw thirty or yep. twenty eight, but were riders riding thirty twos now in the in the world tour? Yeah, they're out there. Yeah, I mean, you know, guys are riding thirty three, thirty four at Roubaix. Um, there are thirty twos out there. We like if you go to this Silka tire pressure calculator, we require a measured width. Because the different bead widths of the rims change that. You know, I've got a a, a set of these really cool three T wheels that have a twenty nine millimeter inner bead width, and a thirty two millimeter tire. Thirty two Condi GP five thousand on there measures thirty five point five, um, and so you know that bead width is so critical in what the tire actually nets out to. Um, but yeah, there's a, you know there's a lot of guys running. Um, you know, 30s that measure 31, 31 and a half. I mean, look at, you know, Pogaccia's, uh 30 mil tires on his Envy wheels because they're hookless. Um, you know, th- those are 30s that measure 31 and a half. And honestly, he would be, for most days at the tour this year, would have been slightly faster on a 28 that would have measured more like a 30, but it's not allowed with the new hookless um, standard. So, you know, that's a thing that's in play um, it, it, as well. Oh. And so I think, you know, you're going to start seeing uh 29 millimeter tires are going to become a thing here for in a bit because you've got a lot of companies that are trying to go um hookless and but they're trying to go you know keep that 25 millimeter kind of inner bead width um and that doesn't work with the 28 it does work with a 30 it will work with a 29 if somebody makes it so those are coming um but yeah for the rest of us you know i would say you know ride your 30 32 you know, get your pressure optimized. You're you're not going to be slower, um, you know, on mm-hmm. those, but you will be more comfortable. You'll reap the handling benefits. Um, and then, yeah, in the world tour, I think we're going to still be time trialing on 28s, maybe, maybe slightly smaller that one of the problems now starts to become logistics. You know, a lot of the teams, um, you know, I did a tunnel test last year with a team and we found, you know, t- the 25 was actually a faster front tire than the 28, but they hadn't ordered any 25s from the sponsor. So there weren't any. And, and you're like, well, maybe we'll solve that next year. And, you know, you, you know how the logistics of that work. It's, you know, some of these things you, you can kind of pull out of thin air and some of it's like, well, we, we have 5,000 tires in a warehouse somewhere and that that's all we get for the year. That's what we've got. uh, Yeah. That's right. It comes back to that sponsor thing, doesn't it? Unless you've got the budget to go out and buy a tail, tires get them relabeled in your sponsor's tire um you know this is like a whole nother realm which gets done every so often the roubaix or the the tour de france's but you know for the 99 percent of the races you just got to sort of make do with what yeah. you've got yeah for sure i guess lastly mate it's a big question but um what is going to be the next big bike phenomenon that you sort of see you know we saw disc brakes come in tubeless tires we were talking about waxing chains you know there's a whole lot of stuff i'm i'm looking over just if you could foresee 
and give us the, the tip up tip off. What do you what do you like in the look of? What do you sort of foresee as the next thing that's coming? I'm hopeful, and certainly the the circles I kind of travel in. Um, I, I would say integration that's less painful than the integration we have today. You know, the we're really hitting an optimal point of you know bikes that are super light, and you know we actually have aero bikes that are comfortable that are also pretty darn light. Um, but the trade-off has been that they're generally impossible to work on. <laughs> like, like, oh, you need to add a headset spacer. Good luck with that, right? Or you need to change a cable you know, or whatever. Um, they're all- I loved coming to the mechanics yeah. and joking after a stage. Could you just change my bars um, before <laughs> right, tomorrow? Right. And they'd like look at you to see if you're joking. You're like, just yeah, kidding. Man. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I, I'm excited, you know, that's a huge limiting factor right now. And even at the world tour ranks, right? Hey, I need a new stem. I I want to try a narrower bar. Oh, sh- I mean, that that could be six hours of work for the mechanics. And so yeah. it, in a weird way, we've sent it sort of marginal gains to ourself into a spot where like maybe bigger gains can't be had. Um, go to the wind mm-hmm. tunnel and say, well, okay, he's on a 130 with, you know, 40 centimeter bars, let's put them on a 140 stem with 36 centimeter bars. Oh, well, that's, that's five, six hours of work. Well, we, and we don't have those parts. Um, So I think smarter, better integration is going to be the next thing that's really necessary to allow the continued marginal gaining um, of of the bike. But I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see, I mean, I think, you know, Trex brought one this year, the, the new tarmac, you've seen it, the, the Cervelo stuff is great. We're definitely getting back to a spot where it won't ever be truly like one bike to rule them all. But, you know, I think of like, you know, in the, like the Venn diagram, like it, it's coming together in a way where you will have comfortable, very aero bikes that are also light and you will be able to, to work on them. Um, you know, it's not next year, but it, it's, I would say three to four years out, you know, I think we're, I, I see so many people really working towards that and, and very smart people that I know and talk to, um, are now focusing on the problem. And that means that it, it's going to happen. That, that gives me a lot of hope. Josh, I, I had a whole bunch of other <laughs> questions here, but we just, we we'll can't even get time. to it. It's, it's been it. <laughs> so fun chatting to you and look, I like breaking it down to my level as well because you you do can talk at all different levels. I highly recommend a lot of people to go across and have a listen to your podcast, Marginal Gains, um, and go and get some stuff from Silka too because I am going to start waxing my chains ever since we chatted a few months ago. That's something I want to do. Um, Josh, thanks for coming on the pod. So much fun, man. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed that one. He is really interesting. There's so much more to unpack there. We barely even scratched the surface. He sent me out some wax. I've seen it in my inbox. It's coming. I can't wait to start waxing my chain and tapping into not only the performances when I'm out riding, but the performance of my chain because realistically, I don't take good care of my chain after hearing what he said about those lubes. There's heaps going on. Make sure you get yourself involved in the Dirty Docker. If you live overseas, there's nothing wrong with that. Fly in, get into the Melbourne airport and drive up to Lansfield. That's easy done. What are you talking about? No barriers there. Next week, we've got a great episode. That will be the race communique with my friends, Luke Durbridge and Tom Southern. Tom Southern, as we speak, is on the Vuelta Espana. As we speak, I'm commentating the Vuelta Espana in at SBS. So listen out for me there. Next week, we're going to unpack that with those two guys. And the week after that, we will have another episode dropping for the members in Life in the Peloton over at the Pelo. So if you are not a member and you want to hear more podcasts, make sure you go and join up either to the Echelon or back in the Doom line, whatever you prefer. There's heaps of benefits there too. You can get yourself a signed copy of the Life in the Peloton book, all included in that membership, plus those podcasts that I'm doing with my old mate, Swain Tuft. Guys, heaps going on at Life in the Peloton. Lots more podcasts to come. Sit back and wait and enjoy. Until then, guys, take it easy. Cheers. That iconic music in this episode was composed by none other than the legend, Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.